Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America online, thisweekinamerica.us. Mid-June 1968, around midnight near the border between North and South Vietnam, a swift boat, PC-19, is sunk by two rockets from an unidentified aircraft. Five sailors are dead or missing. Two survivors and several witnesses report seeing lighted aircraft that move and hover like helicopters flying in the area. U.S. jets are scrambled to the scene and report hits on enemy aircraft. Another swift boat, PC-12, PCF-12, was patrolling south of the border to the scene to assist in the rescue. They also come under attack. An investigation determined it was friendly fire. Our guest on today's This Week in America, James Steffes, ENC retired, was aboard PCF-12. He spent years investigating and concludes in his book, Swift Boat Down, the real story of the sinking of PCF-19, that the U.S. aired in ruling the vessel and its passengers victims of friendly fire. James was born and raised in St. Cloud, Minnesota, always drawn to the sea and adventure, joining the Navy at age 17, serving aboard several ships and shore commands, totaling 26 years of service. James Steffes, ENC retired, author of Swift Boat Down, the real story of the sinking of PC-19, our guest on This Week in America. James, welcome to the program. It's great to have you with us. Uh, great, Rick. Great to be here. That, that, by the way, that's PCF. PC, a, yes, PCF-19 yeah. in the in the book, The Real Story of the Sinking of PCF-19, Swift Boat Down. This is just a, a fascinating story and a real tribute to your determination and trying to get to the answer and to find out exactly what happened. And, and you talk about you struggled with nightmares about that night in, in June of, of 1968. Talk briefly about what you went through with those those two days, June 15th and 16th, and why this has become a mission with you to try to get some answers that, that made sense to you. Well, Rick, I, I came to uh, Vietnam uh, along with a group of engineers, and I joined a crew that had been there several months. So I was a rookie. It was patrol number three for me. And my job was a loader on the back mount. And uh, so it was pretty hairy for me to go up there and, and that's our, our first big encounter up there. And we had, uh, we were in the next area south from the Alpha area. And uh, there was the boat, the PCF-19 was operating off a mothership, Coast Guard Cutter. And they radioed us and said they were having trouble with their radar, that the screen kept going down. So we rendezvoused with them, and I climbed down there, and I met these guys for the first time. And uh, what I discovered is some of the boats, and this 19 was one of them, everything ran off the batteries. And so the starboard batteries weren't charging. Obviously, that's why the... Uh, uh, that's why the radar wasn't working yes so i had a set of jumper cables on board and i climbed down there and we we hooked them up and cross connected the batteries and started up and they took off everything was fine and about three hours later we get this call that they were hit and sunk up there near the demilitarized zone and of course we were ordered up there to look for survivors and uh that's how i ended up there this all happening around one o'clock in the morning and I understand one of the questions you have is what if what if you were not able to to fix that electrical problem? I understand your uh, a swift boat PCF twelve would have been sent in to replace PCF nineteen. That probably would have been you there. Uh, that's correct, Rick. We would have uh, the PCF nineteen was up there for two weeks. The rest of us were all one day patrols. So if something like this happened we would have moved up one area, so we would have been the alpha boat, and then all the boats below us would move up one patrol area, and we would have taken over. From everything that uh, you talk about in the book, it, it gives you a different picture than what the government actually came up with. Talk about your shock, certainly surprise, when the government said this was a, an episode of friendly fire. What was your initial reaction when you heard that? Well, my initial reaction was shock and, and uh, wondering how they could do that because I personally testified before this Board of Inquiry in Da Nang a couple of days after we got back. And myself, my boat officer, one other crewman, and a couple of Coast Guard guys, 
And uh, in my particular case, because they wouldn't let us talk to each other after we had been in there, uh, you familiar with a police artist? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, they had a police artist there with a big uh, pad, and I described what I saw in the moonlight, the description. Of course, I work in the engine room, Rick, so I'm not much on uh, aircraft you know, sightings and so forth. So uh, I just told him what I saw, and, and a guy drew it up, and he said, is this what it looks like? And I said, yes, it does. And they said, that's a Russian-built Hound-class helicopter. So I figured, well, this will go on from there. They said they were going to have a, a, uh, a much more uh, uh, higher up, shall we say, uh, inquiry in Saigon, and then it would go to the final would be at Pearl Harbor. Well, neither one of those happened. And uh, I was sent down to Chulai, and I came back up there for the Christmas party, and I so I asked the my commander, I says, whatever happened to that? And he said, oh, it's friendly fire. I said, really? Yeah. And so uh, we were kind of isolated down there in Chulai, so uh, I just went on about my business, and later I was sent down in the Mekong Delta. And when I come back in 69, I just kind of uh, chalked it off to bureaucracy and didn't do it anymore. Not until 1995. What was it at that point that got you on this this mission where you were out, and we'll talk about the research in a second. I mean, you did extensive research in trying to go back and find out exactly what happened what was it that, that turned you from a skeptic to to someone who really went into the field to get the right answer well a hospital corpsman put an ad in the vfw magazine that he wanted to get a reunion and we you know we had never had one and uh he had been stationed out in antoy and he knew quite a few of the swiftboat guys he lived outside of tucson so we made arrangements since 1995 to uh, meet over there in uh, Phoenix, and there was uh, 18 of us were over there that came from all different places. One guy from as far away as uh, Massachusetts, and it was going to be just an informal gathering of Swift Boat guys, and in the process. Uh, there was a, another guy who was sent from from the East Coast, and he came over there and was visiting with us, and he said that, unknown to be us, uh, John Kerry was involved. They had located PCF-1 and 2, the former training boats, down in Panama, and they decided to bring them up and refurbish them, and one became uh, a monument in uh, Washington, D.C., and the other one is a... Uh, geological survey in Norfolk, Virginia. So they were going to have this big thing on the 4th of July. Well, here we were on Memorial Day, and when this Jim Thomas guy comes up, it was like the third day we were there, and I'm sitting there having breakfast down in a restaurant, and he's talking. He's between me and this corpsman that started this, and they're having a discussion, and uh, Doc says, are you sure you can't find time to do this? Jim Tom says, no, no, I don't have time. There'd be too many people there. And I says, well, what are you talking about? He says, well, this letter from another corpsman down in Virginia who says he was there, and he wants to know if anybody knows anything about sinking a PCF-19. Of course, my brain lit up. And I says, well, I do. And Doc says, well, what do you know? I says, I was on the boat. He said, well, here, would you take this letter and, and follow up? So I got back home, and I called him up, and we talked for probably six hours that night. And apparently, just right after sunrise on the morning of the 16th, a uh, wooden hull minesweeper that he was on was ordered in to, with divers to pick up uh, any bodies that are off the wreck. So for the next two days, they dove on it. They got, you know, publications, weapons, and uh, and all the bodies that were there, except for there was two survivors, 
and then one guy who had got off the boat, but he was wounded too bad, and he f floated off into the darkness, so he's still missing. But I get talking back and forth with his corpsman, and he lives in a little, little small town in uh, Virginia, doesn't know anything about a computer, never saw one, didn't know how to turn one on, but he could write letters. And he started writing letters to uh, to the bureau for under Freedom of Information Act, and he got he got uh, deck logs from ships, he got uh, message traffic, and in the process, he found some other people who found some other people. And when we got all down, I ended up with uh, guys who were aboard two of the ships that were out there, a cruiser and a destroyer. Uh, we located uh, one of the pilots who was in the area flying off the USS Enterprise, and we located the commanding officer of the Air Force jet that was blamed for the for the attack. And uh, Larry, this guy in Virginia, he turned me on to a, a neighbor of his who flew wild weasels over there, which are converted. Uh, aircraft to jam the radars of the of the missiles and he explained to me all about what kind of weapons are carried on an aircraft and none of it that's carried matched what hit the 19 boat 19 boat was hit by two unguided rockets that landed within six inches of each other and it went down into the cabin and exploded and unlike the missiles, they couldn't find any pieces in there, so the whole thing destroyed. And this is the kind of thing they used to justify it all. They said, well, we went up the next day and we didn't see any helicopters. We, uh, we dove on the wreck and we didn't find any pieces. We didn't find anything with a serial number or nothing. And then the next night, the cruiser to Boston was hit with a missile, like they said, hit the 19. It left pieces all over the deck of the ship, tore off a, a ladder, and uh, wounded a bunch of guys. So we're not talking about the same kind of weapon. We're not talking about right. the same kind of a rocket. So uh, this just inspired me more and more. And uh, over 10 years it actually took with all the information Larry got me, and I put it all into this book. And the book is Swift Boat Down, The Real Story of the Sinking of PCF-19. James Steffes is our guest and the author. That's S-T-E-F-F-E-S, E-N-C, -E -E retired. The book you'll find at Amazon. Direct link to the book by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. What's interesting is is all of the research you put into this. And uh, sort of one, one piece of evidence leads to another piece. And you build this trail and you come to this where you feel it, this was an illogical conclusion, enemy fire. Why do you think the government came up with enemy fire? Was it an honest mistake? Did they rush through the investigation? Why did this happen? Well, on the, the next day when I said the they missile hit the, the Boston the cruiser, uh, two of them also hit the Hobart with the Australian cruiser. And so now they had an international type incident on their hands, and if it was friendly fire, they were going to have to account for it. So uh, that was part of the reasoning was to get this thing off the newspapers. Second thing is we were in that stage of the peace talks, and nobody wanted to accuse the other one of escalation. So, again, this would have been an escalation. First time helicopters uh, used in the south. And they weren't going to have that. But uh, when I got through all my research, everything pointed to hostile fire. Uh, the weapon that was used, the sighting that we had. Uh, and now, and this is something brand new, Rick, I just recently, a couple months ago, received uh, some information from one of my Swift Boat friends that had just been declassified from the CIA and the Air Force showing uh, actual helicopter shootdowns d days prior to this and several days afterwards. And uh, it was, of course, it was all shoved under the rug. And uh, 
nobody was supposed to dig it up, I guess, but I did. And, uh, and when we were attacked by this, these two helicopters, our gunners made up on the bow. He hammered away at them until they broke contact and went. And we heard one of them splash in the water. So, uh, like it says in the book, when the LST or when the uh, minesweeper came in the second day to go back over the wreck, they picked up another contact. The divers went down and said, no, that's not it. And they moved on about another 150 yards. Uh, I believe that was the first helicopter, and I believe we shot it down. A fascinating book. It's been described as a tenacious personal memoir that sets a little-known record straight for the author. It's Swift Boat Down, the real story of the sinking of PCF-19. James Steffes, our guest on the program. Many people are really impacted by this story and by the book because the book now gives a whole different perspective to, to that incident. Talk about that because this has really changed a lot of lives for people, hasn't it? Oh, it certainly has. And uh, after, right after the book was published, uh, my wife and I climbed in a motorhome and we went around the country doing a kind of a book tour. And I met individually with the families of each one of the guys that were killed. And that was that was uh, pretty impressive. And uh, one of them was the uh, guy who was actually driving the boat. And I found out that they had been sent information from the government for years and years and years. And they said he was missing. And then they said he was blown out of the boat. And then he was, uh, he was uh, uh, floated away. They lost his body. And then they changed him from missing to dead. Well, this was pretty shocking to the family. And uh, so in 1990, uh, 1998, I found out with, you know, with uh, my research, the POW MIA search team was over there searching that one. And why they didn't dive on a wreck, I don't know, but they located somebody in one of the villages that had a, a, a thigh bone, like a femur, mm, yes. that, they, that they, they had gone out with dynamite and they were blasting off chunks of the aluminum to sell for scrap. And they found an ID card, which belonged to the skipper, and they found this uh, leg bone in the pilot house. Doc tells me that uh, the diver brought up a personal weapon a uh, combat master uh, 38 caliber revolver and when he went over to the diver he says well what are you going to do with that he said well I'm going to keep it and he said well what if it belongs to the boat no he said the guy who had it it's a personal weapon and he won't need it anymore and so that bothered Doc all these years too and as it turned out they the bodies were all turned over to Da Nang, and a big mix-up went in there where uh, two of the guys that were dropped off on one day, one was logged in with the Graves registration, and the other one wasn't. And they they opened up their records around midnight, which they never did, and they logged in two Marines. So we suspect that... Uh, Chandler, that's his name, his body was somehow shipped to uh, the family of a Marine buried somewhere. And, uh, of course, that didn't make the family feel too happy either. But at least they had now they had something to, to bury. So we had a really nice funeral down there in Georgia, or South Carolina. And the uh, Patriot Riders showed up, if you know who those guys yes. are. And uh, it was quite impressive. And... Uh, one guy that came in sort of a, uh, stood off over to the side, and I went over and talked to him. He was one of the divers that had gone down and got the bodies off. And he gave us a lot more uh, enlightenment as to what they actually saw underneath there. And uh, if that would have been a missile of any kind of a missile, uh, the boat would have been blown completely apart. It had two holes in it, and it sank. So I've kind of put this into a calendar uh, type of a format 
And for people that say, well, I can't read that, that uh, it, the, the message traffic, don't worry about that because I explain it in the narrative. But the records are there for in case anybody wants to believe it. Now, Rick, a deck log from a ship is considered a legal document. And once it's signed by the captain at the end of the month, that's a legal record. It can be used as a court martial. Well, the Boston has this information in there, in their deck log of sighting these aircraft and also the PCF-19 going down. So it's all there and it's all legal. Uh, I didn't get any backlash from the Navy. Nobody came back to me and said, well, you know, you can't do this, like has happened with some other authors. Yes. And uh, so it's there is what it is. And uh, I plan to uh, to add to this information what I found out from the CIA and the uh, Air Force. It will be as, fascinating to follow the uh, the rest of the story, as they say, it's such a uh, uh, a tenacious job in getting answers that will make a lot of people feel a lot better, understand better that situation. Helping you get the message out there, I know, has been Reader's Magnet. Uh, what's that experience been like in, in working with them, in, in taking the uh, the message from Swift Boat down to the country? Well, when I first published this with Ex Libris, uh, it was a you know pay to publish, and uh, I only got whatever advertising or marketing that I paid for. And uh, the rest of it was all on my own. Well, Reader's Magnet contacted me. And they said that they could do things like this interview and uh, they make a trailer, which they did. And uh, the book is being republished now by uh, Book Art Press. But what Reader's Magnet is doing is they're getting one foot out there with advertising this thing. So even before it comes out as a, as a new book, it be the same. But I've got all this advertising and of course, interviews with somebody like you, and uh, this will all help. Well, it's important to, to get the word out there. The book that you've done is really significant. It's Swift Boat Down, the real story of the sinking of PCF-19. James Steffes, ENC, retired, is our guest on the program. The book's available at Amazon. You can link on directly to uh, information on the book by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Again, Swift Boat Down. The Real Story of the Sinking of PCF-19. James, a pleasure. Congratulations on a, a job well done. Looking forward to uh, to updates as you go. Thank you for being with us on the program. You're welcome, Rick. Thank you for doing this. It has been our pleasure. Once again, Swift Boat Down, The Real Story of the Sinking of PCF-19. James Steffes, our guest on the program. Books at Amazon. Go to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Link on directly to get information on the book. Back after these messages. <laughs> 